the eternal God, you revealed to the disciples the everlasting glory of Jesus Christ. Grant us who have not seen and yet believe the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we may boldly live the gospel and shine with your transforming glory as people changed and changing through the redeeming presence of our Savior. Amen. Some of you may remember longer, more years ago than I want to think about, there was a TV ad about a brokerage firm named E.F. Hutton. And the ad showed a, a room full of people and they were all talking at once. Then the camera panned over to a corner where two people were whispering to each other. And one says, what do you think the market's going to do? And the friend says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And E.F. Hutton says, and just like that, everything freezes. You know, one of these stop motion things. And the voiceover says, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Well, today, of course, is the last Sunday of the Epiphany, and it's also Transfiguration. It happens every Sunday on the, at this, uh, this time, no matter whether we're in year A or year B or year C in our lectionary. But the Transfiguration of Jesus isn't about E.F. Hutton. It isn't about stocks and bonds or investment portfolios, but it does have an, a, a point to make. The point being when that someone who uh, that we listen uh, uh, when somebody credible speaks, when someone we know knows what they're talking about then we listen. And I can't think of anybody else who commands greater respect or greater credibility or greater authority than our Lord Jesus Christ. And what I hope that you'll get out of what I'm saying this morning is a, is a clear and compelling invitation to listen to the voice of Jesus. This coming Wednesday, churches throughout the Diocese of Nebraska and, and uh, to be sure around the world will undergo a transformation of sorts. All the nice things that we get used to seeing, all the brass and all the silver and uh, the festive hangings that might be around, all get put away because our liturgical calendar is moving from the season after Epiphany to the season of Lent. And our praise filled shouts of Alleluia will give way to Lent's solemn petition, Lord, have mercy. Our lectionary will lead us down from the mountaintop where the transfigured Christ is revealed in glory and will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death, and ultimately it will lead us to Jerusalem, where the cross and the tomb are waiting. Lent begins to weigh heavily on us, and it urges us to recall the, the suffering and the death of our Lord. <clears throat> so in many ways, we arrive at today, this final Sunday after the Epiphany, the, the last Sunday, the, the Sunday before Lent, with a mix of anticipation and of anxiety, we arrive with a combination of joy and dread. But it's no accident that every year on this Sunday we hear the story of Christ's transfiguration on the mountaintop, because at the heart of this story we find these all too familiar feelings. Anticipation diluted with anxiety and joy that are thinned by dread.
Jesus' gospel tells us that Jesus summons Peter, James, and John and takes them up on the mountaintop. And without getting our contextual bearings, we may be tempted to believe that the chosen disciples happily agreed and gleefully followed Jesus without reservation. But if we back up just a few verses in the, earlier in this chapter 9, Jesus tells the disciples that he must undergo great suffering. He must be rejected. He will be killed. And he will rise from the dead. Jesus goes on to say, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. Now as Peter and James and John journey with Jesus to the mountaintop, they're forced to come to grips with the horrifying truth that Jesus, their beloved friend and leader and teacher, will suffer and die. And when they reach the top of the mountain, the gospel tells us that Jesus was transfigured before them, and Moses and Elijah appeared. And as the disciples beheld their Lord, they realized that they were in the very presence of God. But even in this incredible moment of divine transfiguration, Peter could not forget what Jesus had told them before they came to the mountain. He said, Master, it is good for us to be here. And then he petitions, let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, at some level, most of us can't help but sympathize with Peter. As I told the group last night, I identify with Peter because I have the same disease he had, foot and mouth. But who among us would knowingly submit ourselves or any of our loved ones to pain and suffering? Peter's efforts to protect Jesus are undoubtedly done out of acts of love and, uh, and out of devotion. But there are also acts couched in Peter and the disciples' need for safety and security. They had seen a glimpse of God's glory in the face of Jesus, and they wanted desperately to hold on to it. They wanted to protect it. But the moment that Peter and James and John try to hold on and, and protect Jesus, that's the very moment that a voice from above breaks in and proclaims, This is my Son, my Chosen. Listen to Him. But then let's notice what happens next. As the disciples come down from the mountain, they don't rush into the, the nearest town and tell the first person they saw about what they had witnessed. They didn't wait until Jesus wasn't looking to talk about it. And, did, <coughs> and they didn't take it to social media. Luke's Gospel tells us that they told no one any of the things they had seen. Now, most biblical scholars interpret the silence of the disciples as a, as a mark of fear over what they had seen and heard. And it's certainly a plausible explanation, but perhaps there's more than one dimension here. In a lot of scripture, I like to think of the picture of icebergs. What you see is about 10% of what there is underneath it. So we have to dig to get down to the, to the truth. So there, that's why I say I think there's more than one dimension here. What if 
the disciples' silence allowed them to be obedient to God's command. The disciples had heard God say, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. So instead of running and telling the world what they had seen on the mountain, what if they chose instead to obey? To be silent so they could listen. In the world that we live in, it's bustling with noise and chaos, where words and rhetoric are shouted with impunity, stirring up fear and angst. Perhaps this is the word from the Lord that we need to hear. Amidst all of the joys and the heartbreaks of the world, in the face of all the delight and despair that's all around us, and despite all of the things we know and can never know, God beckons to us ever so gently and says, listen. Imagine what, for a moment, what the world might look like if we listened. Not in preparation to respond, but in order to understand. What might our politics look like if we listened more and argued less? What might our schools look like if we teach our children how to listen as intently and deliberately as we teach them how to speak and to write? What might our churches look like if we listened intently for the voice of God from those who differ from us? Henry Nowen is a, a Catholic priest and theologian and uh, well-written. And in his book, Bread for the Journey, he writes, To listen is very hard because it asks of us so much, in, uh, so much interior stability that we no longer need to prove ourselves by speeches, arguments, statements, or declarations. True listeners no longer have an inner need to make their presence known. They are free to receive, to welcome, to accept. The beauty of listening is that those who are listened to start feeling that they are accepted. They start taking their words more seriously and discovering their own true selves. Listening is a form of spiritual hospitality by which you invite strangers to become friends, to get to know their inner selves more fully, and even dare to be silent with you. So as our Lenten journey approaches, and the chaos of the world presses in on us with voices of despair clanging in our ears, may we remember how to listen. For it is in listening that we truly hear one another. And it is in listening that we hear the voice of God. Amen. Amen.